at a 501 yes yes because you are not going to keep your word and i'll probably over keep the word please <laughs> <laughs> Within 20, 20, 25 minutes, half an hour. I'll be very pointed. This is only, only one second. The residual uh, part. So we take your written submissions that you have uh, that you were reading earlier. That's right. That's right. There's only a short portion which was left back. Yeah, yes. I'll be well, reading that part and just oralizing the beginning one set of points just to no repetition. Won't require. What was the number of that? Well, it's a lot should be started. A3. Yeah, A3, right? A3. 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 So, DP, now your written submissions are on? Yeah. Your lot should be written submissions. Last time you were using A3. A3. A3, right? Is. So, well, so, I'll just about seven, eight points. They'll include my written submission, but I just want to yes. make a point. I'm mean, just one aspect which your lordship has heard in a somewhat diffuse manner. I want to itemize it. The question is would my lords Malus not want to prevent such consequences by dealing with the law and laying down the law here? That's the proposition. What are those five plus deleterious, four deleterious consequences for constitutional law, for constitutional morality, for the whole system, the entire edifice plus, which is an interlocking system of plus, uh, defections, speaker, legislative wing, governor, they're all ultimately interlinked into one plus scheme. I, my submission is these five, six, uh, four, five well, those deleterious consequences should impel your lordships to decide it. Here. What are those well, Number one, can you disable the speaker so easily, thereby sounding the death knell of 10th schedule? My lord has heard it fully. Navam Rebia is the main well, standing obstacle and we have argued on that. That's consequence number one. Second, Malaz, is the positive and the negative injunction. I'm just tying up the ends together into a list. Which are against Kehoto. It is not only the practical effect of this positive and negative injunction, but it is juristically against Kehoto. Ah, uh, so no. hearing. I am a veteran of this business. Your lordship may consider keeping a raised platform. Ah, that's that is what on I, which yeah. this this is too little, Malus. This should be raised. Oh. But then I thought, you know, I can't see the lawyer. That's, that's, the that's, problem. Why that's, that's a small problem. price to pay for what your lordship will gain, Malus. <laughs> and your lordship may be missing nothing much. <laughs> because this uh, flat raising, that's right. I, I keep a flat raising on that. It, it helps a lot because otherwise your lordship is bending down. Yeah. And you have to, the way you have to keep yours uh, back uh, straight. Ah. ah, and you have to bend down in any case if it's not raised. No, raising means half of you have vanished from my screen. <laughs> <laughs> That's the problem. I think all of us, but on that side of this, we have these yeah. possible issues. This is a, uh, it's an occupational hazard. The old vintage. 
well as uh, so the second part is well as the positive and negative injunction is not only factually wrong and has caused the change of government that has caused well as i made that argument earlier but it is juridically wrong that's the second consequence your lordships should rectify only supreme court can do these rectifications nobody else can well as it's really futile to have a whole ladder again starting some high court some well as the ladder going all the way to supreme court it really is futile it's, well as nobody can touch these are of kyoto these are navam arabias therefore well as third is the consequence of the governor's direction for a floor test well as there is no way in which the governor can interfere like this especially in a case where disqualification is sub judice or pending the consequence of the governor's direction for a floor test floor test in a pending disqualification matter sub judice at two levels but sub judice at your lordship's level sub judice at the speaker's level it's a double sub judice he's been a lot of deciding in a quasi judicial capacity there as a tribunal Sir, okay. Into in this this third point, sorry, not the board. This third aspect can be, well, as rephrased juridically in a different way. Well, as your lordship is dealing with a legislative issue, primarily, executive has no role to come into it. laterally sideways the executive can't enter it else the governor is though a constitutional post holder an executive appointee so this third aspect is really the executive direct lateral entry into a no go area totally impermissible that's a consequence of lordship alone can rectify should rectify that applies to all these consequences but uh, somebody else will decide it will be partial decision supreme court for the polity for constitutional morality for the whole system must decide this is part of your third point only this is under consequences seems one first point is consequence abc yes. this is the third one the fourth one is bullets it is distinct but it relates to the governor the governor recognizes a split but your lordships can't do it governor will do it the supreme court with 142 today means if a judgment is passed under 141 142 saying we recognize a split your lordship would be acting contrary to law the governor can do it directly recognizes in writing a split with great respect here there is a there is inbuilt double whammy the governor is an error as a constitutional holder and the executive is well as coming into and recognizing the central government executive is coming in and recognizing a split now that letter your lordships may not have seen for some time now maybe in the beginning it was shown just turn to that letter well as for a minute para 7 of the pdf compilation 2 326 correct pdf 326 pdf 326 compilation 2 dated 28th june 2022 this is very important this a constitutional amendment promoting the constituent parliamentary intent to do away with split is collaterally recognized by an executive appointee governor who has no locus which the supreme court can't also do compilation of there are cc2 
There is a number for each uh, document. CC2 it is called, right? Yeah. CC2 of the document, not the case law. Okay. Convenient. 326. Convenience. 326. 326 yes. is the PDF page. So the governor's name on 28th of June. In that well, as volume, it is serial number 5. In that volume. The volume is called serial. Oh, I see. The volume is called serial number 5. My apologies. Where is your lordship? It just takes. P4. 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 Uh, an extra P4. No, yes, sir. We got it. My lord doesn't have it, perhaps. My, my leadership has got it. Yes, please. Dear, is, Udhav. dear Shri Udhavji, the governor writes to the chief minister. I am going to emphasize para 7, but I'll read 2 and 3 also leading up to 7. It's para 7 I want to read, but I'll just read 2 and 3 for backdrop. I am in receipt of a resolution dated 21 6, signed by 34 members of Shiv Sena, legislature party, stating that there is enormous discontent within the Shiv Sena cadre and the electorate on account of alliance with NCP and INC. The, uh, the resolution clearly indicates that the majority members of Shiva Sena legislature party want to exit the alliance with NCP and I INC. And to that end, they have reaffirmed the appointment of the leader of the Shiva Sena legislative party. I am also in receipt of a letter of 21 June addressed by Mr. Shinde to the deputy speaker stating that the purported appointment of one Ajay Chaudhary is illegal, having been made by 16 MLAs without notice, without quorum, therefore the same is inoperative. So this is the governor is saying, well as the governor can hardly at all interfere in any of these subjects while disqualification is pending at two levels. But that apart, leave two and three. Now come to seven. Well, how can the governor say this? Kindly read seven. Is it possible? For Forget the right or wrong. How, why should the governor say it? How can he say it constitutionally is my question to myself. It is thus clear that a majority of the Shiva Sena MLAs have given a clear indication on behalf of the Shiva Sena Legislative Party that they intend to exit from the Maha Vikas Agadi government and that you have been made aware of the same and that you are trying to win over your MLAs and Kader means not democratic. I am therefore confident that you and your government has lost the trust of the house and the government is a minority. I'll just pause and look at the, let's just forget this case for two minutes. Look at the consequences of this letter in the, in the constitutional and the juristic sense. Number one, it is a certification by an executive nominee that the departing disqual allegedly disqualified members, allegedly by me, are kosher. They are not disqualified. They are not disqualified is his confidence. Number two, that you, Mr. Udha, is not the Shiva Sena, but those people are. He is writing to Udha Thakre. Three, he is doing it under the nose of a pending disqualification, then scheduled proceeding and a hotly contested Supreme Court matter. The ordinary mortals were doing it, Lordship take a very serious view. I know Lordship can't issue directions to the governor and content may not lie. But because consider, Manos, if anybody else would write a letter like this, when your Lordship is hearing such a heavily contested matter and the, 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 the speaker is dealing with it, I don't know, Manos, normally Manos, we'd expect some contempt notice. Then some appropriate case must be examined how far the arc of immunity applies. Number four. He is Malus, actually setting up the ground as a precursor. Come to me, I will swear you in. This is an advanced intimation. Malus, this seventh para read as it is can only say, come to me, I am ready to swear you in. Because you are kosher. There is no problem with you, there is no stigma. Only step left is that, nothing is left.
Therefore, my lords, to the other question, my lord, the honourable chief justice asked me on Thursday, my lords, what should, what is it that you want us to do in the event that we agree with you? Lord, she put a question like that. One of the simplest levels, of course, I gave you lots of larger answers. Simplest levels to quash this letter. Now, suppose your Lordship questions this letter, just for a minute. And I do not press, except for one or two other things, in any meaningful way for other things. Just suppose, I am just not conceding anything, I am just giving the Lordship a supposition. The status quo is automatically restored. Lordship doesn't have to say it. And is that constitutional morality? Is that fair play? Is that what is upholding the greatest traditions of governance? What is clearly it is. And certainly, Malads, there can be no bar, immunity, hesitation, legal obstacle, constitutional bar from pushing this letter, if you are also otherwise agrees with me. This letter is not a non pushable document, Malads. It's directly impugned. It's a direct prayer, directly impugned in all the repetition or many of the repetitions. Take it, Malas. Take it that it's impugned. I don't know if you should take out the prayer. No, no, not from here. So, now, Malas, this is the fourth consequence. The fifth is a obvious consequence of this consequence. Next step is swearing, which happens on. 30th. 30th. This is 28th, 30th. In fact, the seeds of that are very clear in Para 7. I told you it's an advanced intimation. It happens two days later. So that's a letter saying you are kosher. That is what is acting on the letter and giving you a constitutional status of a minister. Well, in fact, I'm sorry, the, 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 that swearing in was the chief minister. 30th was a swearing of Mr. Shinde. Chief minister, correct. 38th. So you are swearing in a constitutional head of state. And one of the last consequence is again consequential to the consequence, which is appointment of the speaker. If I may say the new speaker or the speaker. Thank you. I have given a lordship six consequences. I mean, one can make probably seven or eight also, but let's say six. Well, as my respectful submission is A, that these are serious consequences, extremely serious for our constitutional polity. B, they are case neutral to the present case. They are extremely serious for our constitutional polity. B, they are case neutral from this present case. They are juristic questions and they are bound to recur unless your lordship plugs the loophole this way or that way. Third, these are all within your lordship's judicial domain. None of this is a no-go area. Fourth, and this is very important for this, Fourth, only your lordship. I am not saying your lordship may. I am saying only your lordship can decide and should decide this. I am not even making an optional rule. According to me, this is only the Honorable Supreme Court, which can and should decide it here, not delegated to any other authority.
then mulls. These are this is the main point probably. And then of course it follows that your lordship would mulls as an ancillary because your lordship passes ancillary. Yes, now remains. Says mulls. Well, it's for just two minutes more. Well, and at the end, I have one question, but I don't want to disturb your. No, well, I, I I'll just take about ten minutes more. I'm going to make some. So, well, your lordship will therefore restore in the ancillary sense the position as on twenty seventh or sub such date. That is because ultimately your lordship's orders are not well as pericks. They have to have an effect. That effect has to be only that restoration. To restore position as on twenty seventh August, uh, uh, June. That is, this is twenty eighth. So twenty seventh is one day before. Now, Madhus, coming back to my note, and I'll be very quick with that written down. Come to para. Twelve. This is the other facet. I know. Your lordship stopped at twelve thirteen last time. कहाँ पर था? Just come to para twelve of my note. Where you? Eight three, eight three. The one your lordship was using. Eight three. Now what is the point? And I'll be very quick with this. Purposive interpretation. In tenth schedule legislature cases, a lot of is repeated, repeated, and repeated many times. Which page, Dr. Singh? Para twelve of my note, page five. This is that A three note. Page seven. Oh, I see. It's page seven. It's page seven. Page seven. In your lot of it is maybe page seven. Yes. Now, my lords, purposive interpretation. What was this new fashion? Of course, now it's old. Many in calls teleological approach. Yes. What is it? Ah, uh, it is his purpose. Para twelve commences by saying it is further sub respectfully submitted that the above course. The next line is purposive interpretation. Right. Or your lordship calls it teleological approach. One of the most abstract books. Follows that many and very difficult to read. <laughs> Now let us just see what is that purposive interpretation. These are the principles. Why does your lordship talk of the evil of political defections? Next para. Now it will be very brief. Kehoto quoted. Well known to your lordships, Kehoto in para four cites the statement of objects, and then says this: I am reading the evil of political defections will be a matter of national concern, not combated, likely to undermine the very foundations of our democracy and the principles which sustain it. With this object, an assurance was given in the address by the president to Parliament that the government intended to introduce in the current session of Parliament an anti-defection bill. The bill is meant for outgoing defection. Why are lordships saying all this in Kehoto, which is twenty years, thirty years ago? Months? It's thirty years ago, because this says that when you interpret anything in this area, you must push this sentiment, this object. That's the object of this. Next, Jagjit Singh. Just see this, fellows. Jagjit Singh. All the citations are given. I'll not go to it. I'll just read it from my notebooks. The validity of the orders by the Speaker under two two disqualifying certain independent MLAs of Haryana. Three days prior to the election for the Rajya Sabha fell for consideration. Now, she knows in the Rajya Sabha the MLAs vote for us. This honourable court rejected an argument that the speaker's order had been passed in haste, observing that the disqualified MLAs were interested in prolonging the disqualification proceedings beyond the date of Rajya Sabha. Critically, it was held that an independent MLA cannot be avoided, permitted to avoid the consequence of defection merely by not completing the formalities of joining a political party. So, this was not. Uh, this was only by uh, purpose of interpretation. This was extending and stretching. If I may use the cruder word, stretching it, but stretching it for the purpose of promoting this object. Of course, it's an irony. There, you did it to. I mean, they said we'll prolong the disqualification, so he can't vote. Yeah, I said he can vote in the Rajya Sabha. Here, well, it's the same man as the Chief Minister. If Jagjit Singh is right, well, this is a ten times a for sure I case which we are arguing now. There was only a Rajya Sabha election. Now, 29 is what the Supreme Court says. It is also essential to bear in mind the objects underlying the word objects for enacting the defection law, namely to curb the menace for defection. Despite defection, a member cannot be permitted to get away with it without facing the consequences of such defection only because of mere technicalities. The substance and spirit of law is the guiding factor to decide whether an elected member has joined or not joined a political party after his election. It would not be a validity, etc. I'll skip that. Now, Sir Rajendra Rana, Constitution Bench, well-known case, but it was decided on the basis of purposive interpretation. There were gaps. Your Lordship had to fill the gaps. Your Lordship resorted to purposive interpretation. Kindly see that. 
This honorable court rejected an argument that the initial defection by 13. So this is a two-part defection. Initial was 13. Followed by a subsequent claim by 37 MLAs that there was a split in the BSP in terms of para 3 meant that there was no disqualification of the initial 13 MLA. Now, this is a good old days of a split existing. Even then, look at the way Lordship interpreted it. Your Lordship had the split existing, but see how you interpreted it by purposive. The court applied the principle of purposive interpretation to hold the disqualification occurs on the date when the acts attracting disqualification are committed. Therefore, the question of disqualification, whether there had been a split, had to be determined with the initial date, not the subsequent date. Thus, the defence to the plea of disqualification cannot be a subsequent defence and must have arisen at the time when the acts constituting the disqualification were committed. Now, just read two mark portions. I will not read the whole one. If you are actually permit me, the first six lines of 33 only. It may be that the collective dissent is not intended to be stifled by the enactment of 1022. But at the same time, it is clear that the object, mark the word object, is to discourage defection which has assumed menacing proportions, undermining the very basis of democracy. Well, the very basis of democracy comes close to basic structure. Democracy has been held to be basic, basic structure already, obviously. Therefore, a purposive interpretation in para 2 in juxtaposition of 3 and 4 is called for. Therefore, therefore, then well, one thing is clear, the defection is the ground for disqualifying a member. He incurs the disqualification if he is voluntarily given a membership of his original political party, meaning the party on whose ticket he got elected. In the case of defense of a whip, I will skip that one to save time. Come to the next marked portion, next para, the highlighted portion. The fact that a decision in this regard may be taken in the case of voluntary giving up by the speaker at a subsequent point of time cannot and does not postpone the incurring of disqualification by the act of the legislator. Similarly, the fact that the party could condone, could theoretically, there is a para which allows you to condone, the defiance of a whip within 15 days or that the speaker takes the decision only thereafter cannot also pitch the time of disqualification as anything other than the point at which the whip is defied. I am not only arguing, well, relating back, I am arguing purposive interpretation, apart from relating back. Relating back is arri arrived at by adopting purposive interpretation. Therefore, in the background of the object sought to be achieved by the 52nd Amendment and on a true understanding of para 2 with reference to other paras, the position that emerges is that the speaker has to decide the question of disqualification with reference to the date on which a member voluntarily gives up his membership or defies the That is arrived by purpose of interpretation, no other way. It is really a decision ex post facto. The fact that in terms of para 6, a decision on the question has to be taken by the speaker or the chairman cannot lead to a conclusion that the question has to be determined only with reference to the date of the decision of the speaker. An interpretation of that nature would leave the disqualification to an indeterminate point of time to the whims of the decision-making authority. Same would defeat the very object of enacting the law. Well, as by disabling notice to a speaker, you will achieve the same. By the speaker, the governor writing letters will achieve the same. All these are nullifying the current schedule. That's why purposive interpretation is vital. You are also separately noted with me, paras 12, 52 and 53 of Rana. That is done in the earlier department. That's not quoted here. Now, Mr. Srimanth Balaji Patel, the Balasa Patel in para 89, which is quoted, just come to the bold face alone to save time. So, I'm skipping long paras in between. If we hold that the disqualification proceedings would become infructuous upon tendering resignation. Now, this is another technique, Mr. Because Malas, if you if you are disqualified, then Malas, you have to fight an election again to become a minister. Well, if you are disqualified, you must fight an election again to become a minister. So people will just resign and then immediately become a minister. Then you get six months to be elected. You can become a minister now and you not be elected for a while. So to get around that, this is Malas, your lordship purpose of interpretation. If we hold the disqualification proceedings would become infructuous upon tendering resignation, any member who is on the verge of being disqualified would immediately resign and would escape the sanctions provided under 751, 164 and 361. These are remuneration consequences and also most importantly that you have to, uh, uh, you can be a minister but be elected within six months after that. That is not available if you are disqualified. 
such an interpretation would therefore not only be against the intent behind the introduction of the 10th schedule but also defeat the spirit of the 91st amendment then well as dtc an inhibition under the this is of course not a defection case but on the principle of purpose an inhibition under the constitution must be interpreted so as to give a wider interpretation to cure the existing evils now this is important even though it's not highlighted just read this para 118 Legislation, both statutory and constitutional, is enacted in truth from experience of evils, but in general language should not therefore be confined to the form that an evil had taken. Time works changes, brings into existence new conditions and purposes, and new awarenesses of limitations. Therefore, a principle to be valid must be capable of wider application than the mischief which gave it birth. It was born for reason X. Today, our logic will expand it to Y. Tomorrow, to Z, because we learn from experience, brothers. as they said well it's not spirit of law not logic but experience the famous words of holmes holmes man this is therefore a principle to be valid must be given wider application of mischief it gave it birth this is particularly true of constitutional constructions constitutions are not ephemeral enactments designed to meet passing occasions these are to use the words of chief justice marshall designed to approach immortality as nearly as human institutions can approach it Yes, sir. The last two lines above para ninety one, in my, in my mother's uh, note, which is para sixteen, at the end of. In the application of a constitutional limitation on inhibition, our interpretation cannot be only of what has been, but of what may be. My Lord has got that para. What is here? Well, it's in, in within sixteen, I have quoted judgments. In the quotation, there is a para ninety one, two lines above ninety one. Ah, uh, yes. Then, Malus. Next, ninety-one. I will not read your lordship has it, but it's coming out of your lordship's ears. This judgment, five days your lordship heard this. Only one sentence I am emphasizing, which was not relevant for the other case. I mean, I didn't argue it there. This is a quotation, Malus. Last line of two eighty-four. The courts must adopt such an interpretation which glorifies the democratic spirit of the constitution. I'll skip Malus. All of seventeen, I'll skip. 18 is a very important paragraph, but I have in a different way covered it factually. It includes an overlap with the consequences argument. All the facts are itemized there, so I'll skip it once to save time. 18. Have you ever seen my 18? Just to just keep it as a factual summary. Now come to 20. Allowing the disqualification petition to be decided by a person who has been appointed as speaker with the active support of the respondents. And who has condu- conducted himself in a biased and malefactive manner would result in incentivizing the constitutional sin of defection. That's the phrase I want to comment for Lord Chief's consideration. Incentivizing the constitutional sin of defection and would be against the spirit and intent behind the tenth schedule. The same would be the teeth of constitutional morality. Thus, the principle of purposive interpretation demands that the present speaker not be inter- uh, interested. This plus ends the purposive part. Then para twenty two is well as an interesting point. I'm not merger. Just see the irony here. Your lordships has only one defence for us apart from condonation of merger. Merger is this is a supreme irony in this case. Merger is not even alleged by them, claimed by them, raised by them. In case of a merger, suppose eight out of ten, six out of ten, nine out of ten leave. The remaining chap left behind is protected. Under your logic, ten schedule is protected. He otherwise was he is a he is a loner. He would himself be malus. Uh, is protected. Here malus, but for your logic's interim order, which we argued just a few days ago, I am not protected. Without claiming merger, I mean malus. Malus today they are issuing letters and whips. Which fellows? I am not talking about lordship protection. The whip is being issued as we speak, fellows, in, in various places. They are tied in. If the EC has recognised them, but for lordship protection, I would be liable to be disqualified for not following his whip because without invoking merger, without having a merger, fellows, there is no protection. They become the party. These are malus consequence. This is a consequence. Lord, I should add in my six consequence. This is a very weird consequence. It's a very weird consequence. If you have the defence of a constitution, you are worse off. If you don't take the defence of a constitution, you are better off. 
I should have mentioned in the consequence list, or should we consider putting it there? It's an absolutely absurd, weird consequence. Then, brothers, I have extracted para 4 in para 23, that is para 4 of the 10th schedule. And I've made this point in para 24 again. And therefore, brothers, I have ended with this. I'm ending my submissions with one, brothers, judgment which I have decided. That's an absolute end, brothers. That's an interesting judgment on Malas. Where is it found? Where is it found? It's in 3F. Compilation of judgments. 3F. Volume. 3F. 3F. It's a judgment called Indore Development Authority 2028 SCC 129. Constitution. Constitution bench. On restitution. On restitution. Ah, yes. Your Lordship is a party to it. Restitution, no? Restitution. Because that's the fifth facet or sixth facet of Malas setting right. A wrong. Well, you, you call it actus curiae, your lordship will not allow your lordship's acts or judgments to harm a party. Your lordship calls it well, as a situation created by a lordship's order, etc. Another facet of saying the same thing is restitution. And my lord is absolutely right. Which page you want to read? This well, is in this volume 3F at PDF page One minute. 33. One minute. Starts at the 33 is the PDF page of volume 3F and the citation of indoor development is 2020 8 SCC 129. 33. 33. Para? So the first para I wish to read is far away from the beginning is para 335 at page. What oh, 335? Yes, 335. At page? At page 275. PDF page 275. The, may I read it, brothers? The page of the PDF is 275. Yes. My lords have got it. The principle of restitution is founded on the ideal of doing complete justice at the end of the litigation. I emphasize the word complete justice and I emphasize the word restitution. And parties have to be placed in the same position but for, that's the, I said the word but for test, but for the litigation and the interim order. These are very, very important words on the constitution bench. But for, that's the test. But for the litigation and interim order, if any passed in the matter. In southeastern coal fields, it was held that no party could take advantage of litigation. It has to disgorge the advantage gained due to delay in case the list is lost. The interim order passed by the court merges into a final decision. The validity of an interim order passed in favor of a party stands reversed in the event of a final order going against the party successful at the interim stage. Section 144 of the CPC is not the fountain uh, source of restitution. It is rather a statutory recognition of the rule of justice, equity, and fair play. The court has inherent jurisdiction to order restitution so as to do complete justice. This is also on the principle that a wrongdoer should not be perpetuated, sorry, wrong order, not wrongdoers, wrong order, should not be perpetuated by keeping it alive and respecting it. In exercise of such power, the courts have applied the principle of restitution to myriad situations not falling within the terms of 144. What attracts applicability of restitution is not the act of the court being wrongful or mistake. So this is apart from actus curiamens or an error committed by the court. The test is whether on account of an act of the party persuading the court to pass an order held at the end is not sustainable, resulting in one party gaining an advantage which it would not have otherwise earned or the other party having suffered an impoverishment. It's very well put for us. I would comment each word of this. Litigation cannot be permitted to be a productive industry. That is only a fond hope. It is a productive industry. Litigation cannot be reduced to gaming where there is an element of chance in every case. If the concept of restitution is excluded from application to interim orders, then the litigant would stand to gain by swallowing the benefits yielding out of the interim order. Then the quote, I will not read the quotation. Just pause here for five seconds, brothers. I get an interim order. The interim order is obviously not confirmed. If the, if the interim order is confirmed, the matter doesn't arise. It is diff other way around. 
but every consequence of the interim order is enjoyed, gorged, eaten, and then you twiddle your thumbs and say, tough luck, now the final order has come too late, you can't ask for restitution. That is what your lordship seek to address by this passage. It's rather well put. For saving of time, I'm not reading. I would request my lords to read Eastern Coalfields from where it draws strength. It's a constitution bench. And Malus, this is the essence of justice. It's the essence of justice. In a constitutional matter with such grave consequences, it is even Malus A for sure. I'm very deeply obliged. Just one question I had. I mean, it's a tax file. Uh, you said, you know, and both Mr. Sibyl also said the same thing that this is not a case where a trust vote is called when the house is constituted for the first time. So that the governor's power, of course, the governor has the power to call for a trust vote when there is no clear majority under the law. But not after the election that you have for the right, It's not after the election because here the government is formed. Three bad point that, you know, this post formation of government. What is the power of the governor to call for a trust vote? Post formation of the government. What are the circumstances in which you can? That means a running government. A running government. Correct. Well, let's, uh, let me answer on first principles. That we, of course, we can add some material and give a lot of specifically a note only on this. But what is our first principles? The first answer is that zero, where, look at the lot of decide abstract. Zero, answer to lot of direct question, direct answer. Zero power where there are pending disqualification issues in a running government. Because the lawsuit should not mix up the two. One is a normal vanilla running government with no issue of disqualification. One is well, a disqualification pending at two levels. My candid, clear answer to your lawsuit direct question is zero. Number two, the reason is what I have given Malas. It is a lateral entry of the executive in an area where there cannot be any jurisdiction. There is no locus for us. In either 10 schedule or a lordship jurisdiction. Sir, you Number three, if Malas, your lordship's question is premised, has to be premised, and rightly premised, on the assumption that the governor, what he does in the question posed by the Honorable Chief Justice, what is he doing Malas? He is recognizing ABC as the inverted commas majority. There is no relevance to your Lordship's query unless the Malas governor does that. Otherwise, your Lordship's query would not be Malas relevant. Obviously, it presupposes that he is giving some Malas imparting legitimacy, recognition or some status. Malas, how is that possible? In constitutional law, it is not possible. Not so much from the facts of this case, but you know, we are looking at now the yes. perspective. Or on the facts… I tell Lordship… Letter of the 28th of June 2022, yeah. the governor, Lord Balfour, who said that what the governor essentially did was to recognize a split by the letter. In fact, the letter does say that so many people have left you and therefore, you know, that. Without using the word split, is a full recognition of my submission to the Lord. De facto recognition of a split. Yes. yes. Yeah. Now, your answer to that is that the governor, so long as the disqualification petition petitions are pending, he cannot call for a trust vote for the simple reason that you are still a part then of the government which is supported in the House of Form. Except in one case, yes. where well, for some freak reason which I cannot think of it will never happen, that nobody decides to seek to disqualify the other. Hmm. Now, well, suppose. Often the speaker, what he may do is that you no, 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 disqualify no, you at all. No, but that is not so simple. They contribute to the majority of the. No, but I am doing a juristic. I am doing a juristic answer to your lawsuit query. It can never arise in practice, but I am giving a juristic answer. That will have to be a situation where there is no malus cavil and dispute. I mean, it is virtually malus uh, by consent of everybody. But with that answer comes a caveat. It goes back to the origin and the object of the third schedule. Why was it enacted? It was enacted not to encourage these trust vote situations by defections. Unless, this is not unless that is so, it will rise every week, every two one weeks. Of the last point, one of the last points, maybe we can take two minutes yes. to put this to the other side also. Yes. So, what is the There is no clear answer. No, I am very grateful because it helps us to this is clarify in our own minds also. Which is to clarify now. There is in, in assessing the, the strength of a ruling party in the house, whether it is a legislative assembly or a parliament, you have a numerator and you have a denominator. The numerator represents the strength 
of the party when the house was formed. The denominator represents C R to the center of the house. Now, by calling for a trust vote on 28th of June 2022, the governor, according to you, your argument is that the governor therefore recognizes that a part of the numerator has evaporated or has been taken away. It's rather nice for putting a numerator. Yeah, the numerator has been taken away. <laughs> and therefore, now I feel you have lost the part in the house. According to you, that is not permissible because the disqualification is not pending. And he recognizes and gives legitimacy to the numerator. In your logic example, he is recognizing and giving legitimacy to the numerator. The only problem which yeah. I think, you know, which we just stand up, not, uh, which is, uh, yes, yes. which is worrying is, does the yes. governor not also recognize that the very act by which the numerator may or may not be affected? All right. For instance, the numerator would be affected even if you don't treat it as a split and it's a clear disqualification. Then the numerator is reduced by x, the strength of the ruling party in the house, minus y, the people who are defected from, yes. who are never, therefore attain disqualification. But equally, that same act affects the denominator also. Because it reduces the total strength. The total strength of the house. Correct. So, though the governor cannot therefore say, the governor cannot legitimately say that, look, these people have left you, therefore I want to trust. Correct. But can the governor not then say that, look, assuming that they have, they, they, there is no recognizable concept of a split now under the 10 schedule, the effect of all this is that these people have to be reduced both from the numerator and the straight away, straight away. There are many answers. There are many answers. First, this exercise cannot be done by the governor because there is no reason for it generally. You have been arguing that he can't assume to himself to take a decision. First, so let's I, 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 I have lost you three or four answers. I should be noted down. This is my very specific answer. This is an exercise itself very quick, which he cannot embark on. The governor has no such jurisdiction to embark on when there is a running house. Now, second That's answer. Right. He can't exercise yes. embark. But can you not, therefore, they then say, I want this exercise to be demonstrated on the floor? No, no, no I am saying that exercise you can't embark on. Let me answer. Tell you. Tell me not. Yeah, yes. 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 Yes.
the consequence of the 10th schedule can be some basis unless disturbed by the High Court or Supreme Court to act. And till then they continue to be members of the... Assembly. And it would be in REM. Once they're, 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 Otherwise, it would be, this would be really a method... There'll be chaos. There'll be chaos. And unless, I mean, not that it should come into your house, your house cannot, because you know the reality, because of around the country, yeah, yeah. governors also. We got yeah, your governors are like no more angels. Just two sentences. Number one, Malaj. Ten schedule doesn't recognize majority minority. Absolutely. No, correct. Correct. Ten schedule postulates, Malaj, that even if there is a split of a majority, it can't be recognized. The governor knows that. The governor knows that, Malaj. Gov and Malaj, ten schedule also, para three also said there must be a split in the original political party. Then Schedule Mother's Para 3 said yes, original so political. Yes, right. Your main we know that there was no split. Governor knows there was no split in the original political party. So, on what basis will he ever recognize? And your answer to your Lordship's question, how will the governor call Mullers? Supposing one of the parties moves away from the coalition and goes to the governor along with the BJP and says, now we are. That's not an individual act of defense. Yes, that's, that's the act. That's, that's right. So, this is an individual act. It has to be the act of a party. Now, you have recognized the majority as the party and writing a letter to the chief minister. This is unheard of. So, if a party says we don't support the government anymore, yes. that's not a disqualification. That's right? We don't support the government. You've lost one of your constituents. Now government right? calls. Yes. That's fine. That's all right. So, that, I'm yes. sorry. Brother. I didn't want to. Very deeply obliged. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Sani. Thank you, Dr. Sani. Yes. Uh, Wait, please, for for some words, I'll be very brief, man. Plus for 15, 20 minutes. Oh. But, uh, some yeah. issues have not been covered. What are the points that you want? Yes, to have? straight away. Plots, I have made a brief written note, but before I come to the note, but I have made a chart of all the prayers for your lordships. And one or two areas which have not been addressed. If your lordships have a chart which has not the list of four read petitions on this side and two read petitions on that side, this document A. Document A? Yes, ma'am. It's a chart. Document 8, Lord. Consolidated prayers. Signed yesterday, ma'am. Uh, serial number 1 and 2 are read petitions filed by my learned friends. Lord, challenging the notice issued by the speaker. First one. Yes, ma'am. The first two. But that was the Lord, uh, subject matter of 27th order. Now, Lord, item number 3 is a writ petition challenging the action of the governor calling for the trust vote. Now that has also been addressed at length. That is item number three. Now my lords, serial number five at page five is a writ petition by us challenging a decision of the speaker on 3rd July 2022, after his election, changing the recognition of the whip from Sunil Prabhu to Mr. Gogavle. But this is an area which has not been addressed, which I will not uh, briefly touch upon. Serial number 6, Melon, relates to the actions of the governor, not in administering oath to Shinde. And also, my lord, that whether your lordship should decide the disqualification petitions here. And lastly, my lord, serial number seven challenges, my lord, notices of disqualification issued to us. Now, my lords, I will limit myself, my lord, to the challenge of 3rd of July 2022. And this challenge, my lord, is an independent challenge. Irrespective of the view which your Lord will ultimately take as far as disqualification is concerned or governor's my Lord's, uh, actions are concerned. Now kindly have a look at the writ petition itself, my Lord. The writ petition starts. What is that writ petition number? Yes, my Lord. That writ petition is 479 of 2022. Yes. Starts at Milord 470 PDF, Common Compilation 1, 406. 406, no? No, no, it's not 460. Common Compilation. 
सिक्स में लौड़ा मिस्टरी फोर जीरो सिक्स स्टार्टेड फोर जीरो सिक्स फोर वन टू कंपाइलेशन स्टार्टेड फोर वन टू दिस पीरियड यस फोर जीरो सिक्स फोर जीरो सिक्स एंड इफ आई कैन जस्ट क्विकली मलाड पॉइंट आउट माय प्रेयर देयर which is malot one week one month i'm sorry I'm trying to pull out that which common compilation did you say which common compilation pc common compilation 1 convenience compilation uh, serial number 4 four convenience compilation it is convenience compilation convenience not common compilation, compilation. of documents yes 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 please kindly see my prayer page page malot 4 pdf page 408 for zero but this is to quash and set aside the communication of 3rd of july 2022 and the grounds taken are not that the speaker could not have acted on the request of the legislature party the speaker is obliged only to act on the directions of the political party as far as para 21b is concerned The decision of the speaker the itself was not acted on the. Not not. It is not written down any notes. It's there in my note. On the advice of the legislature. Yes, that's right. I'll just show the documents, but not in straight away come to the note. If your lordships have the decision of the speaker, which is of third of July, my lord, at PDF my lord three eighty two, CC two of the same volume. Of CC, I'm sorry, ma'am. CC two. Which one? Two. Well, not CC two. Page three eighty two of the convenience volume. CC two. Serial number five. Serial number five. The running page is three sixty nine. PDF page three eighty two. your lordships are aware that not this decision is taken after the election of the speaker you know on third on the late night of third so kindly see what he says you know just one second i'm just trying to track it down convenience compilation to right yeah. yeah page page 382 i'm sorry 382 with reference to your above mentioned letter i have been ordered to inform you that you have been replaced from the post of legislature party by nominating the name of ajay choudhary in this regard you have raised the objection by addressing the letter on 22nd june in this regard after deliberation on provision in the law honorable speaker maharashtra legislative assembly has cancelled the approval granted to ajay choudhary as the leader shiv sena legislature party and kindly see the next slot and approves the recognition recognize the nomination of eknath shinde as the leader shiv sena legislature party similarly the proposal to nominate sunil prabhu as the chief of shiv sena legislator legislature party is to be cancelled and to recognize the nomination of bharat gogavle as chief whip of shiv sena legislature party has been approved and recorded in the registry So, my lord, my argument is limited to the second part of the decision. Cancellation. As far as my lord, the replacement of Sunil Prabhu by my lord Bharat Gogavle by the action of the speaker on the third, and the only material my lord which was there before the speaker was that letter of twenty second of June of my lord Mr. Shinde, which your lordships have seen my lord. PDF my lord. Page sixty-seven. It was seen. Lordship have seen that, which encloses that resolution, my lord, of twenty-first, appointing my lord Sunil Prabhu. Can you give us a cross reference? Yes, lord. That is page sixty. No, no, the earlier one. It's B sixty-seven. The the letter, my lord, of uh, Mr. Shinde to the honourable deputy speaker is at page sixty-seven. If your lordship just have a look at that. Page sixty-seven at the same compilation. Yes, my lord. Kindly see, my lord, the heading. It is not by a political party. Shiv Sena Vidhi Mandal Paksh Karyal. Clear, my lord, that the letter was addressed by the Shiv Sena Legislature Party at best. And this, my lord, is based 
on the resolution which was passed in Gawati. Which is, my lord, that resolution at page 49. 62. At my lord's PDF page 62, again, Shiv Sena Vithi Mandal Paksh Sorry, sir. Sorry, sir. Sorry, sir. Sorry, sir. Sorry, sir. PDF page 55. Again, the heading is also Shiv Sena. Yes, my lord. Page, uh, PDF page 55, Shiv Sena Vidhi Mandal Paksh Sharyal. Now, the defense to this, in the reply, there are only two defenses taken, which your lordship, my lord, have to consider. One is this, a, this is an issue which is covered by 212. Courts should not get into it. And second, in any event, it is the legislature party which decides the whip. Straight away, my lord, if I can place the reply itself, the only two issues, my lord, which have been raised in the reply. Kindly turn to my lord's PDF page 475 of Convenience Volume 1. Milk. If your lordships have page 475, Sorry, which convenience compilation, please? One. Convenience one. volume one. Lots, I have put all this in the note. Your lots may not be troubled enough to make the. Why don't you take us run through that note rather? Yeah. Yes, yes, Lord. I just point out the pages and straight away. Yes. Sir. While you read it, you can. I will. I will. Indicate. Yes. Sir. Lots, if your lots have page 475 PDF, they are replying lots to this read petition. The. Second column, my lord, from the top. This is the answer to 479. Writ petition is not maintainable uh, in view of 212. And in any event, speaker has no discretion in the matter and has to notify the will of the majority of the legislature party. The lordships have made a note, my lord. Similar, my lord's averments are made at PDF, my lord's. 492, paragraph 35, 34, 35, and 36. So, these are the documents which I wanted to show. Now, straight away, my lords, if your lordships come to my note, your note is? My lords, that is A2, my lords. A2, it's called additional WS. Devdut, your A1 is about the seven judge issue, I think. Yes, no, that's right. Correct. A2. Lords, at page, PDF page 2, my lord, the first point, that as far as the validity of this decision is concerned, it's only your lordships, lords, who can take a view on this. And if your lordships kindly see paragraph 8 and 9, this issue on my lord, whether the whip is to be issued by the political party or legislature party, my, lord, my senior colleagues have already made a lot of submissions, I will not repeat it. Paragraph 8, my lord, I have extracted 2B. And 9, my lord, I have given the reference to my lord, Mr. Sibyl's submission, where not detail or skin may, etc., whether it's clear lord, that whip has to be issued by the political party and not by my lord, uh, the legislature party. Now, lords, coming to the defenses raised in the writ petition, if your lordships have paragraph 12. Paragraph 12, my lords, I have extracted 212. If your lordship sees 212, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It's the paucity of time, my lords, I'm trying to hurry up. Yes. Lord's paragraph 12, 212 I have extracted. The first Lord's criteria for 212 to kick in is that the validity of any proceedings in the legislature of a state shall not be called into question. So my submission is, Lord, that the decision of the speaker 
of 3rd of July 2022 is not a proceeding in the legislature of the state. And my lords, I am fortified my lord, by Mohammed Siddiqui's case, which I have extracted in the next uh, paragraph. Paragraph 34. My lord. The above proposition makes it clear that the finality of the decision of the speaker and the proceedings of the state legislature being important privilege of the state legislature, etc. The proceeding of the legislatures include everything said or done in the house in the transaction of parliamentary business. Now, my lords, deciding a whip or giving recognition to a whip has nothing to do, my lords, with parliamentary business. Therefore, the primary, my lords, ingredient of 212 is not satisfied. Second, my lord, is a more fundamental argument that this is not a mere, my lords, case of procedural irregularity but a case of substantive illegality and unconstitutionality. Your Lord Jesus, my Lord, from time and again said that 212 will not, my Lords, help the Speaker's decision to be immune from judicial review if it suffers from substantive illegality or unconstitutionality, even if it is proceedings in the House. Lord, the latest judgment here extracts the constitution bench judgment in Raja Rampa. <clears throat> and if I can just place, my Lord, paragraph 431 of Raja Rampa, which is extracted at page, my Lord, 6, PDF 6, conclusion, my Lord, S, bottom of that page. The proceedings which may be tainted on account of substantive or gross illegality or unconstitutionality are not protected from judicial scrutiny. Then similarly, my lord, you, an ouster clause attaching finality to a determination does not oust the power of judicial review, but not on grounds of lack of jurisdiction or it being nullity for some such reason as gross illegality, irrationality, violation of constitutional mandates. Yes. Yes. Now, my lords, as far as my lord, the decision is concerned, that this is not a procedural irregularity, but a substantive illegality or unconstitutionality is borne by a plain reading, my lords, of paragraph 2 of the 10th schedule. And my lords, all the authorities and material which has already been relied upon, my lord, that references I have given, if your lordships have paragraph 9, my lord, I have given the references, page 70 to 96. Paragraph 9, page 4 of this note, and I will not, my lords, repeat it. Now, not the second point. Third heading in my note. What is the meaning, my lords, of a political party? Your lordships asked me lot during the course of our submissions. What does it mean? Now, my lords, I have tried to explain because ultimately decisions of a political party, which I will demonstrate, my lord are ultimately decisions of the political party expressed through its leadership. And when my Lord Stu B talks about directions of the political party, it means decisions of the political party as are communicated my Lord the speaker. Now my Lord kindly have paragraph 19 of my note. The 10th schedule of the constitution prescribes, I'm sorry, prescribes a code of prohibited conduct for legislators within and outside the house. Any commission of the prohibited conduct by a legislator envisages penalty of disqualification. Now, my lord, there are two categories of prohibited conduct which your lordships have seen, my lord. And the footnote will show, my lord, I am not going to repeat it, what is prohibited conduct for the purpose of para, para 21A? I have given the references also. Resignation need not be 
not explicit it can be inferred giving a letter to the governor not going to the uh, governor with the opposition parties constitute para 21a all the references are there now when it's the substantive submission on the term political party if your lordships have paragraph 21 now it's not a nebulous concept the term political party occurring in the 10th schedule is not a nebulous concept but a term which has a definite connotation the term political party referred to in the 10th schedule is a association so body of persons which has a definite leadership structure which is recognized by the election commission of india under section 29a of the rpi a political party is not synonymous with its legislators a political party includes in its ambit the entire organizational structure which is spread at several levels block level taluka district and state level apart from the primary members holding those posts your lordships have seen malo as far as shiv sena was concerned organizational elections were held in 2018 and the leadership structure was communicated in january of 2018 malo the documents your lordships have seen i'm not going to uh, point it out again but those documents unequivocally show malo who is the leadership of the political party that is page 1 malo of the of convenience compilation 2 now lords there is the how this concept my lord of political party was included what is the history i will not trouble your lordships with that if your lordship straight away have now 29a which is extracted in para 28 now why this is important is that political party you know is not something which is anomalous it is very clear who are the members what is the leadership structure so when the 10th schedule says directions of the political party it means the directions of the political party as is expressed through the political leadership of that party paragraph 28 you know 29a is extracted if your lordships have pdf page 12 subsection 4 of 29a clearly states that the application shall contain the details of the president secretary treasurer and other office bearers so the leadership structure what has to be intimated to the election commission now my lords detailed guidelines have been made in the article 324 under section 29a and that also my lord is a part of uh, this very uh, written submission if your lordships will not just have pdf page 21 it requires my lord the following documents to be submitted which includes office bearers the lordships may kindly make a note in at page 22 and also my lord affidavits to be given by the president and secretary which is my lord pdf page 34 so therefore we are not coming back to my note mela paragraph 30 the fact that shri uddhav thakre is the president of the party as per the constitution of the party was intimated to the election commission from time to time thus the terminus of co for deciding a disqualification petition under the 10th schedule in regard to the prohibited conduct of a legislature has to be with reference to the state of affairs of that political party as it existed on the date of alleged action of disqualification the term political party in the 10th schedule is referable to the political party as registered and recognized by the eci under section 29a now my lords sir the next section that the 10th schedule is intended to maintain the integrity of the political party my lord your lordships uh, have been taken through it i will not uh, my lord sir uh, trouble your lordships with that if your lordships now have serial number 5 a roman 5 my lord lord this submission here is at us no no roman 5 at page 15 the correct constitutional conduct 
for legislators who claim that they represent the original political party is to first get their claim resolved before indulging into prohibited conduct under the 10th schedule. Now, my Lord, the core question, my Lord, which arises for consideration of your lordships in this case is that when there is an intra-party dispute, can, my Lord, certain MLAs take the defense that, look here, I am the political party and I will indulge into prohibited conduct under the 10th schedule. And after indulging into prohibited conduct, toppling government, forming the government, file proceedings on 19th of July before the election commission for not validating that claim. And the defense taken is, look here, I am the political party. So your lordships, my lord, are called upon to decide what is the correct course of conduct in this situation. Para 36, my lord, it is respectfully submitted that in the event of a dispute within the political party, the correct constitutional conduct for legislators who claim that they represent the original political party is to first get their claim resolved before indulging into prohibited conduct under the 10th schedule. It is submitted that if a legislature or a group of legislators have a claim that they represent the original political party, then it is imperative that such a claim has to be resolved or adjudicated upon and decided in accordance with law. Brahmanand Reddy Manoj was already cited. It is no defense in a disqualification petition to say that the defectors have a claim of constituting the original political party till such claims of MLAs that they represent the original political party attain fruition by a process known to law. Such MLAs are governed by the code of conduct prescribed by the 10th schedule. Any other interpretation would make the working of the 10th schedule untenable. In the facts of the present case, Sri Eknath Shinde and his faction resorted to prohibited conduct of violating the whip indulging into anti-party activities instead of getting their claims adjudicated or resolved in the first instance and then indulging into political activity. So now the question is whether you undertake political activity contrary to Malot's well, 10th schedule, indulge into prohibited conduct or first get your claim resolved. Any other interpretation would lead to 10th schedule being rendered unworkable. This can be demonstrated by a simple example. A legislative assembly has 40 members. Political party A, headed by Mr. X, has five MLAs. Party A forms a coalition government with Mr. X as the chief minister. Subsequently, three MLAs out of five claim that they are the real political party. The said three MLAs go to the governor along with the opposition parties to form the government. If the disqualification petitions are filed against those three MLAs, the petitions will have to be decided with reference to the state of affairs as it existed on the date of prohibited conduct. Now, this is in line with Rana of relating back. Thus, the faction of three MLAs should first get their claim of being the real political party adjudicated and determined, and then take a political decision instead of putting the cart before the horse. This is the only interpretation which harmonizes the provisions of the 10th schedule and the symbols order. This interpretation will harmonize various competing interests and objects and ensure that the integrity of the political party is maintained and at the same time giving individual MLAs or a group or a faction the opportunity to get the political leadership change in a manner known to law. My lords, the next submission, my lord, that if the, sub, if the contention of my learned friends is accepted, that moment there is a dispute within a political party, there can't be a disqualification petition will lead to a complete constitutional hiatus, my lord, as far as 10th schedule is concerned. That, my lord, in paragraph 40, it is respectfully submitted that there cannot be any hiatus in the working of the constitution. It is the contention of the respondent, if the contention of the respondent is accepted, that the 10th schedule proceedings are hinged on a future declaration of their status and or their claim of being the political party, then it would result in a situation where in every case of disqualification, a defense would be taken that the defectors represent the political party and therefore no action of disqualification can be taken. Taking the argument to its logical conclusion, it would only mean that till such claim of the defection 
defecting faction that they represent the political party is decided by a competent forum, the 10 scheduled proceedings cannot be proceeded with. This would re result in a constitutional hiatus. Not then I have cited Supreme Court of Canada, Miller, that on constitutional interpretation and also Miller your Lordship's judgment in the Advocates on Record Association. Then, my lords, serial number seven. Lord, I respectfully submit that ultimately, my lord, your lordships will have to lay down the batting order, as my lord, my lord, is this uh, Narsima put it. Lords, that is paragraph serial number seven. It is imperative for this honorable court to lay down a constitutional sequence in order to harmonize the tenth schedule. 179C as well as para 15. As is evident from the facts of the present case, the respondent MLAs, instead of first resolving their claim in a manner known to law, have resorted to prohibited conduct. The proceedings before the election commission were initiated only on 19 July, that is, much after the disqualification petitions were filed on 23rd June 2022. Then, paragraph 44 is the Lord's uh, submission. Thus, it is imperative that this honorable court lays down this constitutional sequence and the legal permissibility of three distinct constitutional stroke statutory procedures, namely one proceeding of disqualification under the 10th schedule, that is one second is 179C, Lord, which has already been argued, and then my Lord's paragraph 15 of the symbols order. It is respectful submission of the petitioners that the 10th schedule proceedings necessarily have a constitutional precedence over two and three above. Second, my Lord's para 15 proceedings, which are based on the majority test, cannot be undertaken and proceeded with without final adjudication of the 10th schedule. And third is the Nabam Rebia, my Lord's argument. Then last two submissions, my Lord, are on the symbols order. And my Lord, I have submitted that the reason is, my Lord, that decision to the defense that's not an issue which falls here. Yes, sir. One of the questions which was referred to your lordships, my lord, in the reference order relates to the power of the election commission. But the only defense which is taken, my lord, it's a separate, yeah, separate. Yes, sir. The reason is, my lord, the defense which is going to come, the lordships will probably hear, is that look here, we have been now been adjudicated as the party. So, therefore, the disqualification petition are anyway not maintainable because it is, my lord, sir given by a person who is not a political party. So, not just two submissions on that. If your lordships have paragraph 47, Malot, I have submitted that as far as para 15 is concerned, it cannot be undertaken Malot, without determination of the 10th schedule, which your lordships will examine in other matter. And last, my lords, paragraph 49 and 50 is that the decision of the election commission Malot, is a declaration of status that who is the political party pursuant to a split which has arisen. That can only have a prospective Malot's effect. It can't relate back. Kindly have Malot's uh, paragraph 49. It is submitted that under paragraph 15 of the symbols are. Yes. It is submitted that a decision under paragraph 15 of the symbols order is a decision which can only have a prospective effect. Then, my lords, I have quoted paragraph 15 of the symbols order. It's a quasi judicial, my lords, adjudication under the symbols order. That, my lord, adjudication of the dispute results in an order declaring, my lord, XYZ as representing the political party. And this submission is, my lord, that can only have a prospective effect. Now, my lords, kindly see the consequence. If it is held otherwise, that it relates back, it would have, my lord, in our respectful submission, complete, my lord, disastrous consequences as far as the 10th schedule is concerned. Because when the decision comes, for instance, in this case, it has come in February, my lord. Petition moved in on 19th of July. And today to say, that in view of this decision now, in February 2023, all the actions of prohibited conduct get effaced, 
would be to destroy the complete intent, letter, and spirit you know, of the tenth schedule. Not uh, all the other submissions and judgments are there. I'm grateful for a very patient meeting. Grateful. Okay. Uh, we'll start after lunch. But just before we rise, uh, Mr. Paul will first uh, argue. Then after Mr. Jetlani and then Mr. Manindra. Roughly, Mr. Paul, how will you space out your submissions? How long uh, would you take? You'll take the rest of the day today. My lads, the Solicitor General would, of course, also appear. I will not the governor. Uh, so, Mr. Lads, Paul, I would definitely take today, right. whatever time, and tomorrow. Day and tomorrow is Wednesday. Yes, my lads. Enter. Yes, my lords. I have three and a half days of arguments or four days of arguments. All right. So we want to wrap up the matter by the end of this week. Right. So, uh, you know, what we would suggest is that, you know, you can begin. Of course, you will take the whole of the day today. If you can sort of complete, say, one hour after lunch tomorrow, say, by three o'clock, uh, that would ensure that then Mr. Jetlani and Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Man 